All right, so my talk is going to be on uh, password cracking high performance computing. This is the problem we're trying to solve. Password crackers need more power. Yes, really, we need more power at all times. Um, in the beginning, we used to load up tons of CPUs, do things like MPI, do MPI clusters, do CPU cracking. Uh, Barbell can easily speak to that with John the Ripper. Um, so we moved on to GPUs. Uh, general purpose GPU computing kind of revolutionized the way that we started looking at um, massively parallel uh, computation for passwords. More GPUs are obviously better than one GPU, but how many GPUs are enough GPUs? How many GPUs are enough? No, never enough. Exactly. They're like a spider. They're never. Exactly right. <laughs> so here's our potential solutions for this. All right, we can either build up or we can build out. When I say we build up, it means we're taking a single system and we're stuffing it full of as much GPUs as we can. There's several of us that have systems that have 87970s in them. Um, before that, we were doing like, you know, uh, quad 6990s, so we put 8 GPUs max. The reason we we're looking at that 8 GPU numbers is that's the maximum number of devices that the AMD Catalyst driver supported up until this most recent release. So we're doing everything we can to build our systems up to get to that magic number of 8 GPUs a system. The problem is that was expensive as hell. And we had all sorts of problems with certain motherboards wouldn't support 8 GPUs. Uh, same thing with BIOS, didn't have enough PCIe config space to support 8 GPUs. And the driver itself only supported 8 GPUs, so we couldn't surpass that limit. We really wanted to go more than 8 GPUs. So the solution instead is to start building out. Instead of building up one single box that has 8 GPUs, start building up multiple boxes that have 3 or 4 GPUs. But distributing the load can be a bit of a problem, right? There's all sorts of complexities involved with distributed cracking or grid computing, whatever you want to call it. Enter virtual OpenCL. I'm assuming at this point everyone's aware of OpenCL platform that allows general purpose computing on pretty much a, an array of devices, not just GPUs, but also like PGAs and DSPs and such. Virtual OpenCL is exactly what it sounds like. It makes remote GPUs appear as if they're local GPUs. Okay? It implements the entire OpenCL 1.1 standard, it was created on the Barrack at Anand Shiloh at Hebrew University, and it's distributed by Mosix. If any of you have been in the cluster business in the last 20 years, you've probably heard the name Mosix around. BCL has a few pros. It's free. Free is in free beer. All right? It supports any and all OpenCL devices, not just GPUs. It works with any unmodified OpenCL app, and that's not exactly the case. That's why there's an asterisk. <laughs> The most recent version of VCL does not work because of a bug in the AMD SDK. However, um, for our purposes, Yins has been kind enough to work around that bug in Hashcat, so that's no longer a problem. And I've just been told about an hour ago that VCL released a new version that supposedly works around this as well. But we have not tested that, so we're not going to cover it. But VCL completely eliminates the complexity of distributing load and makes clustering ridiculously easy. The problems are it's closed source and closed license. That means we can't edit it and we can't distribute it. So vendors like Backtrack and uh, Pen2 and some other distributions, they can't create like, for example, VCL live CDs and distribute it so we can easily spin up clusters. Um, VCL, for all intents and purposes, are made for uh, large, you know, permanent standing clusters. Think of like your typical uh, education or scientific environment, probably like what you guys have here at the university. Um, they only have binaries for 64-bit Linux. No Windows binaries, no 32-bit binaries. Excuse me. And we need a high-speed LAN. We need some kind of high-speed internet connect. Uh, VCL, we cannot do any kind of internet clustering. So those of you who have in your minds of creating a large worldwide botnet, it's not going to happen with VCL. You have to wait for the next best solution. So how does VCL work? All right, It provides a shared pool of devices directly to whatever OpenCL-enabled application you have. It's completely transparent to the app and the user. For the most part, aside from what we just talked about with the bug in the latest AMD SDK, um, the application does not need to be aware of VCL. It only needs to be aware of OpenCL. It has a basic two-layer model. We have a broker node, which acts as the head unit, and we have compute nodes. The broker node executes the kernels on the compute nodes, and the compute nodes compute. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So the broker node, this is your front end. This is where your software stack is installed. In this specific talk, we're covering Hashcat support. So your broker is where Hashcat's going to be installed. 
You only need to have the VCL library and broker to even install. You don't need any VCL devices, and you don't need any drivers installed on the head unit. So for all intents and purposes, your head unit or your broker node could be a virtual machine, uh, could be a small set-top box, it could be anything, as long as you have enough RAM. We'll get to that in a minute. The compute node's your back end. You don't need to install your OpenCL Aware software on the back end. All you need is the VCL back end daemon and your OpenCL devices and the proprietary driver that enables those OpenCL devices. So if we're talking about an AMD Radeon uh, compute node, all you need is VCL and uh, AMD Catalyst installed and you're ready to rock. So this is your typical VCL architecture as I kind of just mentioned. You got your broker node here that's running your uh, what they're calling the CPU process. I got these directly from Anand Barrett from Mosix. Uh, what they're calling the CPU process is going to be your software stack, in this case, Hashcat. Um, just going to talk directly to the VCL library. The broker is going to talk to the backend daemon, all your compute nodes, which are, of course, going to perform all your compute operations on the OpenCL devices. You can also have an alternate architecture. You can have the broker running on a compute node. And this is actually what we do with our cluster. I'll cover that in a little bit more. But Basically the same process, except for you have both the broker and the OpenCL daemon running on a compute node, and there really is no head node uh, or no broker node, like, you know, no dedicated broker node. Is. So here's the actual workflow here, and this is the workflow as implemented with Hashcat. If you're using VCL with Hashcat for password cracking, really all it's going to do is over the network, it's going to start executing kernels left and right. So it's going to do a bunch of back and forth between your broker and your compute nodes. <coughs> now, VCL does ship a library called SuperCL that enables network optimizations. Basically, it allows for a single call for multiple executions, direct file I.O. from the OpenCL memory objects, and asynchronous data transfer with the broker. So an application that supports SuperCL is only going to make one call to the compute nodes. Compute nodes are going to execute all their kernels. They have direct access to the local file system. It doesn't necessarily have to be local. It could be a SAN or a NAS, right? Well, that's a stark contrast to here. We have all this ping pong back and forth from the broker to the compute nodes where it's executing all these kernels. What you're doing here is you're going to have to have low latency links in order to execute these kernels really fast. Because for fast hashes like MD5, NTLM, we're talking about you know hundreds of billions of kernel executions a second. So you need a really low latency link between your, your compute nodes. In this model here with SuperCL, you don't need that here between the broker and the compute node. But from your compute node to your file system, you're going to have to have some sufficient you know, I.O. bandwidth there. So all you're really doing with SuperCL is you're shifting the bandwidth needs and the latency needs from the communication to the broker and the compute nodes and the compute nodes in the file system. Should that be a SAN or local disk or SSED array, whatever you got. Now, this is the good part you've all been waiting for. How do we actually use VCL with Hashcat? All right. As I already mentioned, Yin Stru added VCL support for up to 128 AMD GPUs and OCL Hashcat Plus version 0.9. Yay! Yay! <laughs> yeah. um, and in that process, because the AMD SDK is broken with the latest version of VCL, um, both Yin's and myself had very extensive conversations with uh, Amnon and Amnon at Mosix, and they were more than happy to help debug the issues once they realized we did not want to turn the world into a, a password cracking botnet. <laughs> <coughs> so there's some, some considerations you have to take in mind before you just jump right into this whole VCL game. All right, bandwidth. For brute force and mask attacks, you need very little bandwidth. But for wordless attacks, you're going to need a lot of bandwidth because you have to transfer those, those wordless. You know, we're talking, most of us here are probably 5, 10 gigabit wordless, right? You're going to have to transfer those wordless in real time to your compute nodes. Latency. Slow hashes can tolerate some latency because the kernels take longer to execute. But fast hashes cannot tolerate any latency whatsoever. Um, we kind of talked about the different models there with SuperCL. At this point, Hashcat does not have SuperCL support. So your communication between your broker nodes and your compute nodes has to be low latency and high bandwidth. Now memory. The broker node needs a crap ton of memory. If you're familiar with Hashcat, the, dash, the dash n value, which is your uh, acceleration value, which you can cover a little bit more if anyone has any questions about that. The higher you set it, the more memory you need. If you set that end value all the way up to 800, you're going to be looking at probably you know 30 gig of RAM utilization. So you have to have a lot of RAM or a lot of swap space to get that kind of performance out of it. So my company, Stricture Consulting Group, has built out a cluster with the help of Bitweasel. Um, Yay! Yeah. 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 So we have five 4U servers. Again, we're building out, not building up anymore. We're tired of building up. We're going to start building out. 
So within these four, these five servers, we have 25 Radeon GPUs, which actually is comprised of dual GPU chips there. We have 10 7970s, 459 70s, 369-90s, and a 5870 for good measure. We have a four-time uh, single data rate InfiniBand interconnect that provides uh, 10 gigabit uh, total, about 8 gigabit aggregate, and then about 7.5 gigabit when we start talking about doing IP or TCP IP over InfiniBand. Uh, we use about 7 kilowatts of electricity. The data center is not exactly happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> Um, and in our cluster, the broker daemon runs on the cluster node in order to limit or to reduce the amount of bandwidth that we need because we only have 10 gigabit interconnect only, right? Uh, so we only have 10 gigabits to work with. So on one box that has seven 7970s, which is the most GPs that we have in the cluster on one single node, that's where we're running the broker, and that cuts down on our bandwidth utilization quite a bit. So if anyone's familiar with the outcat output of Hashcat, you're probably used to only seeing one to eight devices. Well, this is what Hashcat looks like when we spin it up on our 25 GPU cluster. <laughs> crying, <laughs> crying. Share. So we got some pictures here. I have a lot of requests for pictures. Um, Bitweasel spent probably about 16 hours total helping me build all this crap out, and I'm infinitely grateful. Um, some sauce for some of the backs here. As you can notice, we said that we're building out, not building up. So that means we don't have to try to worry about stuffing four cards into these boxes anymore. We can leave adequate room for cooling. So we have one GPU space, well that's the InfiniBand controller, another GPU space, another GPU. Now we have one PCI slot in between each card, so we're not having to worry about the cards overheating anymore, which means we can push the clocks higher. And overclocking, yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this box here is one of our attempts to build up instead of building out. It used to have eight 7970s, had to remove one 7970 for the InfiniBand controller. Not a problem, because we're clustering. And we got two more boxes here. Close up there, uh, someone asked me for pictures of the InfiniBand connector, which I don't know why, CX4 connectors are pretty boring looking. But, uh, there's a close up of one of our uh, six or three GP boxes, three seventy nine seventies in one box. Um, another close up picture there. This is pretty much pornography, so feel free to like, you know. <laughs> are these online yet? <laughs> <laughs> I will make them available just for you before you go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Behind a paywall, a paywall, I guess, huh? <laughs> All right. Um, someone also asked for pictures of the InfiniBand switch. This is an old top spin 120. It's probably about seven years old, but you know, I paid 300 bucks for that on eBay, and 300 bucks for 10 gigabit hardware, I'll take it. Yay! Yay! Yay. Yay. Exactly. Um, and we also use a lot of zip ties for, for cable. 10 gig adapter can easily be uh, 500 bucks new. Exactly, yeah, just for the HCAs. The HCAs, we bought for 35 bucks each on eBay. Nice. They're, old, they're old Mellanox controllers. Get all this stuff secondhand. Our entire Finiband stuff, everyone usually gets really turned off, especially like if you look at the Hashcat forums right now where I've talked about this. People get really turned off when they hear the word InfiniBand because as soon as they th hear InfiniBand, they think, "Oh my God, that's you know tons of money." My entire InfiniBand job, I bought for 800 bucks total. That's including all the connectors and cables and everything. So 800 bucks out the door to, to cluster up five nodes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Three, 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 three meter cable length or something. Which yeah, these are matter. yeah three meter cables, which is about the max for the old CX4 connectors. If you want to go more than that, if you want to go more than 20 gig, you can start doing InfiniBand. Excuse me, over fiber, and you can get all the way up to 300 gigabit aggregate. So, yeah, this guy's kind of living here. <laughs> <coughs> this was my first attempt at building up. Well, not first attempt, but this is my latest attempt at building up instead of building out. This is the box when I had just eight 7970s in it before I pulled one out. It's a very pretty picture. Parish probably going to want to spend some time looking at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so bandwidth, this is really important. I actually screwed up my bandwidth estimates before I got the InfiniBand link. And I'll, I'll cover that really, really briefly. So when we start doing wordless stuff, we're doing everything on gig E. And we, we noticed that we're getting maxed out about 800 megabits a second. And I thought, okay, must be network. So spend a few hundred bucks to buy some InfiniBand hardware, get the InfiniBand hardware installed. Still seeing about 800 megabits a second. But okay, it's limited by the disk, not a problem. Throw everything on a RAM disk. Still seeing about 800 megabits a second. All right. <clears throat> That's not to say don't use InfiniBand, because InfiniBand's really important to get rid of those latencies. Ethernet latencies are way too high for, for the fast hashes that have you know billions of kernel executions per second. 
Um, but for brute force, we consistently use less than 8 megabit a second. And that's with uh, 25 minus 7, whatever that is. I'm not feeling well, so someone else do the math. <laughs> 25 minus 7 divided by 8. That's about how much bandwidth you're using per GPU for brute force. Really low. The reason it's not doable over the internet, though, is because those latencies that we've been talking about. For wordless, we use no more than 800 meg a second, um, which does actually bring you know gigi into possibilities of the latencies. Then we average the peak of 88 megabit per physical GPU. Now, this is the good part, a little bit more pornography. How fast is this cluster with 25 GPUs? For NTLM, which is what I really care about because it mostly do domain audits, 348 giga hashes a second. Let me quantify yeah, yeah. that for you. Yeah. For leaf 8, 95, char 95 character, you know, care set, 95 to the 8th key space, uh, five and a half hours to exhaust the entire leaf 8 key space. Um, LM is also significant, 20 giga hash a second for LM. That means that we can take the entire 69 to the 7th key space for LM, get through it in six minutes. <laughs> Yay! Um, and then of course, SHA-1, 63 giga hash a second, MD-5, 180 giga hash a second. Now, that's impressive because those numbers are huge, but what's really nice is the slow hash benchmarks. Anybody familiar with MD-5 crypt yeah. is a bitch, right? 77 mega hash a second. That'll take care of that in no time. <laughs> Bcrypt, using a cost index of 5, 71 kilo hash a second, very significant. SHA-512 crypt with the default 5,000 rounds. 364 kilo hashes a second. Mm. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That is all. That is my lighting talk. If you're looking for me to keep in touch, find out what else I'm doing, that unpronounceable word there on Fnet or Freenode or JM Gazi on Twitter. And that's my talk. I think we should allow for two minutes of questions, perhaps if anybody have anybody have any questions? What's up? How much was the um, the price of the whole rack? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's a little bit difficult to quantify because you also have to take into consideration how much shit we caught on fire. Uh, how many power supplies and motherboards we burned up, um, how many GPUs we bought before we really knew what we were doing. Um, but if I was to copy that one. To copy this right now, do you have an estimate, Russ? Um, I'd call it probably 20 grand. I'd, I'd probably part. estimate a little bit over. I'd probably say 25. But yeah, 20 to 25. It really yeah. depends on what you're doing. Your, your wife is actually listening, Russ, oh, so know. you know. <laughs> Most of the money came from him. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that was fine. That was fine. Hey! Yeah. 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 The big cost for this for that particular rack is the 87970 rig, yeah. which, uh, as we noted, that's not the most cost-effective way to do it. It was a huge if waste. If you go, uh, that, that box alone, I think, was about 10 grand. Yeah, it was 10 grand. And if you go with the three GPU boxes, you can get away with a less high-end mainboard, uh, less, you don't need as much power supply, which if anybody's bought power supplies beyond about 1,200 uh, watts, the price just goes through the roof. And uh, basically, you're just paying a bit of a space penalty, but the three GPU boxes really seem to be the sweet spot. Yeah. And more importantly, you can cool them on air, and you can end up burning out video cards at 100 plus Celsius for weeks on end because yep. they really don't like that. Uh, which card is best value for mine? 7970. That's the best value for mine. Best bang for your money. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else got a question? My voice is starting to go, so. <laughs> I'll be around afterwards. I'll be here all yep. I'll be here until Thursday. What's up? Why not plan the media? <laughs> so I, I'm assuming you don't crack very many hashes then. Um, NVIDIA hardware, and this is a huge offline discussion that we can have, NVIDIA is extremely subpar for hash cracking. Their architecture is just, it's... it's it basically, it's two things. They lack a barrel rotator and they lack a bit select function. Right. And those two things are the vast majority, uh, can replace the vast majority of operations in a modern hash function. 
So they're doing probably five times as many instructions uh, per algorithm, depending somewhat on the algorithm. Okay. And they, they just, you know, they can't compete. A Do small it. idea here, uh, you and Ben is actually working for ST Microelectronics that, you know, produces silicon. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sensing you know, some sort of, you know, yeah, know pile agreement here. I don't know much about the silicon. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to keep it like that. Yeah. <laughs> for AMD GPUs, you have direct access to each of the stream processors. And AMD GPUs, they don't set aside any stream processors for specific functions. Like NVIDIA, you have shaders, you know, just for floating point calculations and such. AMD, you have direct access to every shader or every stream processor, and a stream processor is a stream processor. It doesn't matter. There's no specific function for each. In NVIDIA, you kind of have an abstraction that between each of your compute units, you have shaders that you can't access directly, and some of them are dedicated to certain tasks. So in NVIDIA, you have fewer shaders at higher clocks that you can't directly access, whereas with AMD, you have direct access to you know thousands of stream processors. So that's another difference as well. Um, but yeah. A three hundred dollar AMD card is going to kick the shit out of a five hundred dollar video card. That's just reality. So that's why I did. Okay. Uh, one. Uh, yeah. This this is kind of a question slash poll. It's just because you brought up MOSX, which sort of made my heart warm, and I love open <laughs> MOSX until like two four, and then it died, and right. can't use it anymore, and I'm crying yeah. inside. So did you or did anyone ever look at uh, Dragonfly DST? No, did AMD even make it? No, Dragonfly, right? Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know for uh, GPU or not, but I, just I, in general. Yeah. I downloaded an image of it like the other week because <coughs> apparently, for some reason, there are more Dragonfly BSD users hitting my project than FreeBSD users. Okay. But I haven't even installed it, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah since we use Hashcat almost exclusively, you know, so uh, Yen's only provides uh, you know, Linux yeah. binaries for that, so we don't really yeah. consider it BSD. Um, I don't know, does AMD even have proprietary drivers for BSD? I'm pretty sure it's just Linux. Um, I don't know that AMD does. NVIDIA has I know NVIDIA. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, I'll break it off. All right. Yeah.